very precious and a very unique relationship. We have a relationship, the opportunity of a relationship with the creator of the universe that no other creation, part of the creation has, none. He created us in His image that we might have this fellowship with Him. However, in His foreknowledge, He knew we would fail. Because we're not gods, are we? We're not gods. Though He made us perfect and though He put us in a, a sinless environment, in His foreknowledge, His great mind, His great, this great Creator, knew that we would sin, we would fall into a common ruin and rebellion. So, then came what some would call the grand debate. I mean, if it's God, who's He debating? It could be a conversation between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, just like you would have conversations with yourself, right? Uh, do you ever talk to yourself? Do you ever have these discussions in your mind? And I often have discussions like, taking both sides and looking at things. And so uh, God in His infinite, in, infinite being was having this debate. And I don't know that it was necessarily a debate, but there was a question. And the question is this, how can sinners be redeemed? How can sinners be reconciled to their Creator? How can my broken world, my broken creation, that which I've made, be restored? How's that going to happen? And only the great mind and heart of God our Father, He's the one who determines and decides. This is very important for us to understand, folks. Very important for us to understand. That's not our decision to make. We don't tell God how we're going to get back into fellowship with Him. He created us. He made us. We're the ones who have fallen into sin, and it's His plan. It's His way. He is going to give us a plan, and so... A covenant is signed. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, enters into a covenant with His Father that in the fullness of time, He would stand in the sinner's place. He would pay the sinner's debt, that He would head up in Himself as many as the Father gave Him and become the second and restoring Adam to them. Though through the first and falling Adam, they with others had been destroyed. That's God's work. That's what God is about doing. That's what his, uh, his, his redemption is about. And so we know this. We need to understand this. God's salvation is none other than the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son. That's who we're here. That's why we're here today. That's who we talk about today. God's salvation is none other than the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son. We'll see a little bit later on that there was a man in the temple when Jesus was eight days old. Eight days old. Come on, moms, you remember that? Eight days old. They're still cute and cuddly, you know. They've probably just kept you up all night for eight days, but they're still kind of cute. Actually, I think babies, well, never mind, I won't go that way. Uh, eight days old, they take him to the temple. There's a circumcision rite that's going to take place, takes place in the temple. And as this young couple, Joseph and Mary, poor as can be, come into the temple, an old man, well on in years, steps up to them and says, wait, who's this that you have in your arms? And Mary sweetly says, his name is Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, Simeon's ears per perk up. This is the one. He knew that. How did he know? Because he has been constantly in fellowship, constantly seeking that which has been promised. And God's salvation has come to the temple on this day. And so, there's a very famous account that's recorded for us. But before we look at this uh, account in Luke, you know... <laughs> We make a big to-do about Christmas, don't we? Don't you? Maybe not so much in Taiwan, but if you were in America or some of these other places, man, I mean, it goes, it's just nuts. Everything turns some shade of red or green, and there's music and jingle bells everywhere, and there's this, this fat, roly-poly red guy walking around somewhere. I mean, it's, it's all this Christmas holiday season, and the, there's families getting together, there's buying presents, there's giving presents, and, and 
trees and, and all kinds of stuff that we call Christmas. But when you look at the biblical account, what strikes me, and again, struck me as I was going over it again this week, is how very minimal it all is. How very simple and very plain it all is. Matthew, who is the Jew writing, he only has this to say. His, his description of the birth, the actual birth, is really very brief. He doesn't say much about it at all. He just says, when Joseph, well, Joseph had had a dream saying that Mary, his wife, had, uh, Mary, his, his betrothed, ha has a baby that's not his. And so um, she's carrying this baby through the Holy Spirit. His name's going to be Jesus. So Matthew describes the actual birth very briefly in this verse. When Joseph woke up from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. End of birth. No more said about it after that. I mean, we come to Matthew chapter 2, and there's the wise men, the, the kings that come from the east, and, and uh, they come and see the, the baby, but that's it. I mean, when it comes to giving birth, I could probably tell you more about the birth of my children than Matthew's written right here about the birth of Jesus Christ. It tells me that maybe it's not all that important. In fact, is just a side note. If you go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he tells us that the end of the thing is much more important than the beginning. Beginning is easy. And listen, <laughs> those of you who have raised children, the beginning is easy. It's when they become teenagers, when you want to nail them in a box and put a hole in it and wait till they turn 20, you know, I mean... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but he's saying that, the, and, and in the Jewish way of thinking, it's really the, the, the death is where they celebrate. The funeral is where they celebrate because of the accomplishments that, that have been done. And so, when we look at um, Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke adds some details here that are much more so, much, he gives much more detail. Uh, you can turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And if you don't want to turn your Bibles, it'll be up here on the screen. But if you'll wait until I uh, punch mine in, that would help so I don't have to look up at the screen. This is actually what we would call um, the Christmas story. Usually, every Christmas, we'll take some time to turn to the book of Luke. We'll turn to chapter 2 and read these verses. And, and I'd like for us to look at these verses today and see what they have to say about the birth of Jesus Christ that we celebrate on this day. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, and from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because... He was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, cloths actually, wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region. There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Let, let me just pause here for a moment. If you were to read back again and go through Luke chapter 1, read through Luke and Luke chapter 2, Put a circle around every time you see the word fear. It's amazing how much fear is involved in this story. Back when, when Zacharias meets the angel in the temple, ooh, he's so afraid. Back then when the angel appears to young Mary and tells her that she's going to be with child of the Holy Spirit, there's fear. He says, don't be afraid. Constantly, every time we hear this, don't be afraid, here come the angels again. They tell the shepherds, don't be afraid. So um, while it's a time of great joy, we need to be reminded 
that there, this is an incredible event that's taking place. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. After reading this account, it's amazing to me what we've done to Christmas. <laughs> I, I mean, Christmas looks nothing like the real birth that's recorded for us in the Scriptures. You look at the creche, and by the way, the word creche is kind of a nursery. It's a nice, soft feeling. It's, it's like a place where you put your, it's a nursery where, nursery where you put your children, so we have the Christmas creche. I promise you, there was no creche at Christmas. I promise you. And the, it wasn't nice, warm, and with uh, shining lights and so forth. I, and again, I, I'm, not, I'm not being critical. I, I don't intend to be critical here. It, I'm just trying to, to get us to, to get beyond and get below the surface and to, to see that, um, uh, how amazing it really is that in Luke's simple description, here's what Luke says. Check out this verse. This is, this is the birth of Jesus Christ here. It's one sentence. It describes the actual birth of Jesus. Very simple, very descriptive. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. What in the world have we done? That's all there is. There's nothing about a stable. There's nothing about animals. There's nothing about... Um, uh, um, well, there is something about shepherds, but they weren't there at the time of the birth. Basically, in the description of Jesus Christ, there's one thing that we notice there, that he was put in a manger because there was no room for him. That's it. That's it. How in the world did we get where we are today? It's pretty amazing. In those days... They had, um, when travels went traveling, there wasn't a motel or a hotel that you'd go check into. I, actually, it's, it's really not much different than many, say, third world countries or countries where there's smaller living places. You go from village to village. Uh, if you're to go to places in Nepal and visit them, uh, there isn't a place, you, you can't go into the local hotel there if you're going to the village. You get to stay in somebody's house. The interesting thing I noticed about in Nepal there is that the houses usually had fairly high ceilings. They weren't two floors. They were just a single-story structure, but there was usually a, a uh, um, loft where the family would sleep, and they would go up into the loft, and they would have their sleeping up there, but everything else took place down below, and at night then, that's also where the animals would come in and be protected. Um, it can get rather stuffy sometimes. I remember when um, uh, several years ago, traveling in the Philippines, way down south, we took a truck and we drove down this river for hours and hours and hours. I'm sure my back has still not recovered from it. But uh, we stayed in someone's house. And they, it was a bamboo structure with a bamboo floor that was up above. And the chickens and the pigs were down below us all night long. You heard the sounds and the smells. And that's, that's, that was life. And uh, so when we picture this, we need to understand, first of all, that, that the travelers would stay in the homes. It's just that at this particular occasion, because of the, the, the taxation that was taking place, the town was full. And so all the homes that had been opened up 
had people and visitors in them, and so the lofts would be filled with people, and consequently, there wasn't any place else for them to stay except that on the first floor. And on the first floor, there may have been animals, or that night they may have put animals out. Who knows? But the only clue that we have of a stable with animals is that there's a manger, a manger or a feeding trough. Otherwise, there's not a single clue of all the cows and the, and the donkeys and the sheep and also in the, that are in the, the, the creche and all that kind of stuff. So, it, but the, we, we do have the manger. Where did we get all these other story elements? Well, you know what, things happened over time and so forth, but uh, it, it, it keeps us, it, it, we need to be aware that we don't allow then the simplicity of Christmas to be crowded out and complicated through this. But I want you to notice this about the manger. I, I hadn't noticed this before as many times as we go through the, this, uh, this story. The manger. This feeding trough is mentioned three times in that passage of Scripture that we read about the birth of Jesus Christ. Three times. It's mentioned when Jesus is born and she puts the baby in a manger. It's mentioned when the angels come and they say, you're going to find the baby in a manger. It's mentioned again by the shepherds when they go there and they go, oh, wow, wow, look at this. This must be the one. He's in a manger. So three times. Why is this detail of a manger mentioned? It's, it's really, we, we pass by it so quickly. But that's because the manger is intended to be a signpost. It's pointing us in a particular direction. The angels announcing the birth to the shepherds made it very clear. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And look at verse 12. Look at this. And this will be a sign for you. You're going to find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now, it wouldn't have been unusual for babies to be wrapped in swaddling cloths, but it would be unusual to find a baby in a manger, in a feeding trough. Now, my dad, my granddad, my granddad raised sheep. And uh, so when we got to go to the farm, we would see the sheep, and uh, my, two of my uncles were, were uh, farmers. And um, I know a little bit about a feeding trough. <laughs> It's like when you have teenagers and you let them loose at the table. It's like a feeding trough, you know. I mean, it can get messy sometimes. I, I, I love teenagers. Please don't get me wrong. I, I had six of them, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they were wonderful, wonderful years. It's just that, uh, anyway, um, I have to be careful because I can be taken out of context here. We're talking about feeding troughs. And they're just very simple things. You can see by this picture here, it's, it's just made out of, and oftentimes in those days, it had been made out of scrap wood, nailed, cobbled together, and uh, that's where the feed would be put in when the animals were fed. On this particular occasion, um, this one may have been in use or it may not have been in use. It may have been laying around and it was just put in with fresh straw in preparation for this baby because there was nowhere else to put it, nowhere else to put it. And so, when the angels come and announce the birth to the shepherds, the angels make it very clear that this manger is a signpost. Po po sign post. They're pointing their fingers and they're saying, look for the manger. Don't need to look for the wise men. Don't need to look for the cattle that are lowing. Don't need to look for the stars in the sky. Don't need to look for the warm, cozy fire in the, in the manger there and so forth. Just, I mean, in the stable, look for the manger. The shepherds took off for Bethlehem. They were, and here they, they go to this little town, and they've got to find, because the angels said that they're going to find them there, a little baby, a newborn baby in a manger. I mean, it's not sitting out in the middle of Main Street at the main circle there. You know, I mean, oh. So they've, they've got to go through the town, and how do, you, how do you think they found it? Well, I believe they found the Savior because, again, the angels told them this is all under the direction uh, of, uh, of God's plan. There's nothing that's left to chance. But uh, the shepherds find this baby, and they know something because it happened exactly as the angels said it would. 
exactly. There's two things that these shepherds learned when they saw the baby lying in a manger. The first thing they learned is that the message that the angels gave them was not a fluke. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't a show. Because everything that the angels said happened. Listen, folks. When the Bible says something's going to happen and it happens, we need to learn from that. That's evidence. It's a signpost. It's pointing us to its truth and veracity. They also knew that that baby that was in that manger was their Messiah. Can you imagine what it's like to be a Jew, to be under the pressure of the Roman government, to be these shepherds that are out there on this, in the field at night there with their sheep, eking out a living. Shepherds were not known for being the, 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 the stalwarts of their society. They, they heard this message first before everyone else. Here is your Messiah. Here is your Savior. Here is the hope that you've been looking for and yearning for after 400 years of silence. You'll know because he's sitting on a throne with a great big crown on his head. No, it's a tiny, helpless, weak little baby tucked away on a manger cobbled together from scrap wood. Are you kidding me? How, how incredibly simplistic could it be? But rather than focusing on the manger, because the manger isn't important in itself. It's a signpost. It's, it's pointing us. It's a finger pointing to the identity and the task of the baby boy who's lying in it. Those shepherds summoning, summoned from the fields, they're just like King David. When you, when you mention King David to, to Jews, they're looking for the kingdom of David to be reestablished again. Let me tell you, every single Jew who knows his Old Testament is waiting for the kingdom of David to be reestablished. When the king came the first time, they rejected him and said, we don't think so because our king isn't born in a manger. But the announcement was made to the shepherds just like David was summoned out of, the, uh, out of the fields from attending the sheep to be anointed as king. So the shepherds come from the fields to see the king in a manger. This is a confirmation. It was a confirmation to Mary and Joseph who for up to this very moment until those shepherds showed up, they thought they were the only ones who knew the secret about this baby. And the shepherds showed up and said, Whoa, Mary. Do you know who this is? This is the Son of God, the angels told us. So Mary and Joseph, whatever doubts or thoughts they may have been having, who, who knows what's going through their minds, they have an outside confirmation that this is indeed the Son of God. The birth of this little boy is the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God in all its apparent weakness, its insignificance, its vulnerability, this confrontation between this tiny little baby and his kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. And who's going to win? Well, if I was a betting man, I probably wouldn't bet on Jesus' kingdom. I mean, just look at the facts, right? But let's take a closer look here. Take a closer look at the last part of verse 7 because there was no place for them in the inn. No place for them in the inn. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no place for him. Now, here's the thing. When we look at this, we see that at the very core of this story is the rejection of Jesus. He's rejected. This Lovely, warm Christmas story about the cuddly birth of King Jesus. And what do we learn from it? Jesus came to be rejected. Rejected. He's shut out. There's no room. Even in his birth, Jesus didn't have a place. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Later on, he says to the disciples, hey, the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. That began with his birth. Luke is teaching us something here. He's teaching us something about the king, and that is this. 
he will be rejected. He will be rejected. And it's, it's not something that we would necessarily want to embrace. But think about this. I, I mentioned later on in chapter 2 about this devout man who sees Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple for the rite of circumcision. If we drop down in chapter 2 and read from verse 34, here's what it says. And, and Simon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Jesus came to be rejected. Jesus will make people mad. Jesus will make people angry. Jesus will make people so upset that they want to uh, nail him to a cross. You know why? He reveals their hearts and People are angry and they speak against him. We, we've already gone further in the story. We, we're jumping way back now to, to Luke chapter 2. We, we're up to Luke 13 and so forth, and we see this story, and we see what's been going on here, how Jesus has been opposed. So knowing what we know so far in our study, we shouldn't be surprised that the opposition is building, that soon they're going to take the king of the Jews and they're going to nail him on a cross. But listen, lest we think that this is something Jesus wanted to do. Jesus didn't want to be rejected. He was not looking for rejection just to say, oh, what a poor soul I am. There are some people that are like that. Uh, just a, a little story. Um, this guy was telling about a man who he, he had terrible problems with rejection. He was seeing his counselor, so he came in to see the counselor today, and he was just really angry. And he said, I walked by this house where there were roofers, on the roof, pounding in the, the, the tiles, putting the roof up. And he said one of the roofers was using the uh, um, Morse code, and he tapped out, you are a loser, you are a loser. <laughs> and so he's, it's just that there's some people who, in everything, they see a message of complete rejection. That's not what Jesus is here for. In fact, is he's embracing the rejection. Why? Because in embracing his rejection, in, re in embracing his repudiation, we have his acceptance. Because if Jesus had not been rejected, we would not have acceptance. We may not understand why, but the implication for us is we won't understand, we, if we don't realize his rejection and the importance of it, we will not be able to understand his coming to us. I want to give you very quickly three reasons then why Jesus is rejected. He was rejected, first of all, because he didn't meet the world's standard for a Messiah. I mean, really now. Born in a manger, are you kidding me? Born in a stable to two young kids who were poor as mice and uh, didn't even have a car or a donkey. That, you know, what did grows up in a place called Nazareth. Nazareth is like growing up in the worst part of town. I mean, not worse in, in, in morals, but just very poor. It was, a, it was just a rabble-scrabble type of town, and people were eking out a living. And then he didn't have a dad. He had to take care of the rest of his family. He became a carpenter using his hands. Jesus did not look like, nor did he act like a Messiah. He did not act as, this, as was expected of him. When his parents took him to the temple, they brought, in, they brought with him two doves. The two doves was the, the lowest and cheapest of all sacrifices that was accepted in the scriptures. The acceptable sacrifice was a lamb, a lamb that had been kept in the, and that was without any kind of blemish. They were so poor, they did not even own a little lamb. And so when they went to the temple, and even if they did, it would have been their only lamb, and that would have been all that they would have had to sacrifice. All they had to give was these two turtle doves. And, and folks, that is an indication of what they were having to eat, too. That's the best that they had to give. They didn't keep the lamb aside and say, well, we'll have that for us so we can eat it. No, they took the best they had to give, and that was those two, uh, two turtle doves. They were the poorest of people. The Messiah, are you kidding? Is this what we expect? 
Jesus' hometown friends, the people who were with him and grew up with him, they vehemently rejected him. We saw in the book of Luke how they were so angry with him, they took Jesus up to the brow of the hill. They were going to push him over and kill him. He's one of their own. He's one of their own. What did they know of Jesus? All they knew about Jesus is this, is not leadership material. He's an illegitimate kid from a poor family on the wrong side of the tracks. His father died young. He's raised by his mother. He's got no connections. He's socially marginal. Of course, he's rejected. Secondly, Jesus was rejected because of the threatening nature of his message. Well, we sure are seeing this as we study through Luke. You see, the thing is, deep in our hearts, deep in the hearts of all humans, we know there's something wrong. We know there's something about us. We're sinners. We need God, but we don't know how to fix it. Not only do we not know how to fix it, we also have a strong desire within ourselves to justify ourselves. We want more than anything to say, I'm not as bad as that person. I don't really deserve this. We don't want to recognize the nature of our sin and how, how sinful we are. So when Jesus comes with this message of repentance, people hate him. They reject him. King Herod did not want to be reminded he was not the king. As a result, when he heard about this little baby being born, and he was told that this was the king of the Jews being born in Bethlehem, and he wasn't report, he told about where his location was, he went into that area and he killed all the babies, all the babies. And there was a great weeping there because he could not tolerate the fact that he was not the king. This is how we react. Pharisees didn't want to be revealed as spiritual frauds. And we're seeing this over and over. Jesus called them hypocrites. Nobody wants to be called out as a hypocrite. But you see, Jesus' message of truth, it's like a bright, shining light. It pierces our very hearts. It reveals the wickedness of our heart. And whenever Jesus comes to any one of us, any one of us, he comes with this message that reminds us, you know what? You may think you're the king, but you're not. You're not. There's only one king, and our responsibility is, how can I be in alignment with the one king? Thirdly, Jesus was rejected for the substitutionary character of his work. The reason Jesus was rejected is because he came as a savior. He came as a savior. To save us, he had to be rejected. To save us, he had to be nailed to the cross. He had to die. His blood was, was drained from him. He was slain for our sin. But because Jesus came and he was the substitute for us in the work of redemption, his rejection is our acceptance. He was rejected because of my sin, because of our sin. Because Jesus is spoken against, I am spoken for. Because Jesus was riled for his uh, righteousness, the fact that he was truth, I get to stand before the throne of God and I am spoken for. Those that are in him. Because Jesus had no room for him, because they didn't have any place for him, not only in the inn, but in their hearts. Because Jesus had no room for him, I can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He makes room for us because he had no room. Here's the thing, folks, and, and, and I hope we get this, especially in this season. Anyone who's going to be connected with Jesus, we will remind people of the same things that Jesus reminded them of. And as a result, we will experience rejection too. Nobody's coming clamoring to Grace Church and to you folks here. Nobody's coming clamoring to you say, wow, man, you're a great Christian. We want you to be a leader here. Nobody's coming to you and saying, wow, you've got good Christian faith. You're a solid Christian person. We want you to be in charge of our company. Nobody does that. Nobody says, wow, you make a great teacher because you have great 
Christian faith. You believe in Jesus. The fact is, if we're going to be connected with Jesus, we're going to remind them of the things of Jesus. And when we begin to remind this world of the things of Jesus, we will also experience the rejection that he said. Let me also say this, folks. Let's be careful. I know Christmas is over, okay? I should have preached this last week. But let's, let's get beyond the superficiality of the season. Let's get beyond all the tinsel and all the, the hoopla and look back at the simplicity and the reality of that first birth, the, the first story. And then, in closing, look at the manger. Look at that manger. That manger is pointing to the baby lying there who is the true king, the true king. The question we need to ask ourselves is this, is he your king? That king, when he came to earth, did not wear a crown worn by the great kings of governments. He wore a crown of thorns. In just a moment, we're going to observe a communion service in which we take the bread and we take the juice. It's a picture. Again, it's pointing. It's a signpost. Just as the manger pointed to the king, so this very simple uh, ceremony points to the fact that our salvation comes at the rejection of Jesus Christ. The broken bread is a picture of his broken body. The juice that we take is a picture of the blood that was shed for us. It's a picture of his death that we're to picture again and again as our salvation. Jesus Christ is the gift of salvation. So in preparation, let's just bow our heads in prayer, shall we? Let's examine our own heart and life and to realize that God sent Jesus. He is our king. He is our salvation. Our fathers, we come before you today. It's an awesome occasion. It really is that we should come on this day at this time and celebrate this time of uh, communion where we remember who you are. Lord, it's just absolutely astounding to me, absolutely astounding that such a simple person, simple birth could be so great and amazing. The words that you spoke, the life that you lived, the death that you suffered, the resurrection that you wrought on our behalf. Lord, we're, we're humbled that we can take this time to be reminded again, yes, God came, took on human flesh to die on our behalf as a sacrifice for our sin and to conquer sin in the resurrection that we might have life. And so we're reminding ourselves of that today.
Scriptures tell us that on that night when Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples, and they, he took some bread. The Bible says that he broke it, and he said, take this in remembrance of me. Shall we take and eat? Another thing that Jesus represented was the end of the Old Testament era and the beginning of the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. The law has not been disbanded. It's been fulfilled in Jesus. And so on that last night with his disciples as he was preparing to give his life, he said, take this cup. It's, an, it's a sign, it's a picture of my blood, of the new covenant, which is given for us, the covenant of grace. Shall we take and drink? Father in heaven, as we remember your great sacrifice for us, I mean, it must have been a huge sacrifice for you to lay aside your kingly robes your scepter of power to be conceived and born in this world as a tiny helpless baby. 
And Lord, to be limited by human frailties, to be fully human, to uh, be hungry and to be tired, to suffer abuse and rejection, to be frustrated even at times, and to have your obvious power, your obvious ability shown in healings, that, that you truly are the Son of God, to have all of that uh, be rejected by people you came to save. And Lord, we, we humbly come before you this morning to recognize all those things to be true about you, that you are God, God the Son, God the Savior. You're the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, your sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, makes us whole. Lord, you alone are worthy to be our king. We humbly bow before you. We ask you, Father, that we would only be obedient and true to your instructions, your words, and that we would be good citizens of your kingdom, salt and light to this world. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming out on this Christmas Day. So appreciate it. I trust that you have a great time now with family and friends. Enjoy your holiday tomorrow. Uh, the church staff, we're going to be off Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday since we, did, we didn't get Saturday and Sunday off. All right? So thank you again so much. There are some snacks and refreshment. Have a time of uh, enjoy, uh, enjoying fellowship together, and God bless you. Have a great time. To raise up God's only show me To raise up Jenny don't continue Who should To raise